call to worship. Lord, we come because we're tired. We toil and stress, press and push. You remind us that through Sabbath, the labor without rest is never good. Teach us again the rhythm of life, the value of activity and rest. The gift of renewal and recovery. Free us from the tyranny of ceaseless work and from the temptation to make leisure another labor. Grant us the privilege of resting in peace and by living in grace. Restore perspective to our work, joy to our spirit, quiet to noisy lives, and value to rest and renewal. May it begin in each of us this week, this day, and this hour. Prayer of Confession We want to touch the hem of your garment, O Lord. Forgive us for being afraid to touch those who come to us for hope. We want to love the whole world. Forgive us for ignoring our neighbor. We long for peace. Forgive us for the pain we inflict on our families and friends. We want to share with those we love and like. Forgive us for walking past those who need you most. Forgive us, loving God, for we do not excel in everything you call us to do. Give us grace to touch those who frighten us, to carry the bread of life to the hungry, to offer the blessings of the kingdom to everyone we meet, even as you have given grace to us in Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Declaration of Forgiveness Remember, friends, that if your conscience wants to keep on condemning you, God is greater than your conscience and forgives all. Christ's perfect love has overcome our fear, has forgiven us, and made us a new creation. Go and live as forgiven people. Amen. First scripture reading is taken from 2 Corinthians chapter 8 verses 1 to 7. We want you to know, brothers and sisters, about the grace of God that has been granted to the churches of Macedonia. For during a severe ordeal of affliction, their abundant joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For, as I can testify, they voluntarily gave according to their means, and even beyond their means, begging us earnestly for the privilege of sharing in this ministry to the, to the saints. And this, not merely as we expected, they gave themselves first to the Lord and, by the will of God, to us. 
so that we might urge Titus that, as he had already made a beginning, so he should also complete his generous undertaking among you. Now, as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in utmost eagerness, and in our love for you, so we want you to excel also in this generous undertaking. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A reading from Mark, the four, fifth chapter, beginning with verse 21, continuing through verse 43. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered around him, and he was by the sea. Then one of the leaders of the synagogue named Jairus came, and when he saw him, fell at his feet and begged him repeatedly, My little daughter as is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. So he went with him, and a large crowd followed him and pressed in on him. Now, there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. She had endured much under many physicians and had spent all she had, and she was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. For she said, if I but touch his clothes... I will be made well. Immediately her hemorrhage stopped, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Immediately aware that the power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned around in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing in? How can you say, who touched me? He looked all around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before him and told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, some people came from the leader's house to say, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing, overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. He allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the house of the leader of the synagogue, he saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. When he had entered, he said to them, Why do you make a commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. Then he put all of them outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him, and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means, little girl, get up. And immediately the girl got up and began to walk. She was 12 years of age. At this they were overcome with amazement. He strictly ordered them that no one should know about this, and told them to give her something to eat. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Dr. Henry's recent news was incredible. Vaccines are working. Our hard work is paying off. We return to in-person worship in two weeks, while Zoom calls and backyard visits have sustained us they have limited our ability to connect meaningfully. Today's scripture contains two healing stories that underscore the relevance of risking ourselves to make a connection to the community of faith. In the first story, Jairus, a synagogue leader, is desperate to find Jesus. His 12-year-old daughter was at the point of death, and he begged Jesus to follow him to his home and lay his healing hands on the girl. Jairus took great personal risk to see Jesus. Jairus raised, risked his status as a synagogue leader to go to this healer who was outside the synagogue and continually thwarted pur purification rites. Jairus knelt in humility before Jesus and begged him repeatedly to help his daughter. Without hesitation, Jesus went with him. As Jesus and Jairus walked through the crowds, we learn about a woman in the crowd who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. She had spent all she had, and her condition was growing worse. She also took great risks to approach Jesus, since she was considered unclean. But Jesus was more about making connections with the vulnerable, proving to them that they were beloved and valued. This woman decided just to touch the hem of Jesus' garment. Immediately, he knew what had happened. Jesus said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing in on you. How can you say, Who touched me? The woman knew her gig was up and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. Jesus said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. When Jesus alluded to her faith, I think he meant the faith by which she was willing to risk exposing her condition publicly in a crowd. Willing to risk touching one who had the reputation of someone who took chances on those who were considered unworthy. She could leave the interaction with Jesus free of what had plagued her for 12 long years. We aren't sure how Jairus felt about the unexpected interruption, for what he felt were more pressing matters, saving the life of his dying child. Suddenly they were confronted with a sad update. Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But Jesus, not one to take hearsay medical advice about life and death matters, said to Jairus, Do not fear, only believe. Jesus affirmed Jairus' faith to believe in one who gave him the courage to believe that the impossible could happen. In both instances, Jesus said something about faith. What does have faith mean to us? The risk for us is interpreting faith as a pithy saying we hear too often, have faith, only believe. It sounds like a formula and something that may seem automatic. When I worked as a hospital chaplain, I remember five-year-old Leah 
who had an autoimmune disease. In that day, such a disease often resulted in death. Her dad was a member of a religious community that told him to just have faith and Leah would be made well. He said the fact that she was in the hospital meant that he did not have enough faith. A great danger for us is in reducing life and faith to a simple formula where if we believe God enough, our wishes will be granted. The woman with the issue of blood enacted her faith to risk coming to Jesus so that she might have a new life. Jairus enacted his faith when he risked his professional reputation to save the life of his child. As both of them risked touch, touching and being touched by Jesus, they showed their faith in action. Paul writes in Corinthians, Now as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in utmost eagerness, and in our love for you, so we want you to excel also in this generous undertaking. Paul was asking this particular church to show their faith. They were to be faithful in their giving and to excel in faith with speech and knowledge and eagerness and love for one another. What might that look for us? We enact our faith when we stay connected to each other and to our church in these unusual and perilous times. Jesus acknowledged the faith of the woman who had courage to touch Jesus in a crowd of people where she was not supposed to go, and the leader who was willing to seek Jesus when he thought he was going to lose what mattered most. What are you willing to lose for new life? Amen. And now go to where you find friends and neighbors as well as family and strangers and share God's never-ending love, even in small ways with them. Go now with that faith which dares to touch the outcast with hearts that break for the pain of others. Share Christ's compassion with friends of the broken. Go now, caring word and wonder to a weary world waiting in silence for hope to be realized within all creation. And may the God of peace go with you, sustain you, and guide you now and always. 
Amen.